Hi everyone, welcome. We'll just um just let the room fill up a little bit more before we before we start. Oh, hi everyone, welcome. Um, so yeah, welcome to our uh, webinar on using honeypots to analyze attacks and train your team. Um, this is the uh, second in our mini series on Security Operations Center. Um, if you have any questions throughout, either put them in the chat or in the questions tab. Um, we'll do those at the end. If there's anything that we can't cover because of time, um, we'll follow up directly afterwards. Um, and uh, as you'd expect, we'll send you the uh, recording afterwards and the slides um, over to Tom. Brilliant. Thank you, Ham. So what I wanted to do today was, was talk about honeypots and why I find honeypots interesting from sort of a personal development point of view, but also from how we use and, and how we use honeypots inside the SOC and, and how you can use honeypots inside the SOC regardless to, to size and, and sort of an overview about what's out there, what we've used, what I've used, how I find them interesting, how I've got different use cases around them, and then sort of going through different stages of honeypots from the sort of the very simple to the very complex and touching on why, why I use these different ones and, and how you can also use them sort of in the, the world. So I'm Tom, lead engineer for, for Microsoft services here at Clarinet. Um, I spend a lot of my time in Sentinel. I spend a lot of my time in Defender. I've worked now in, in SOX for about six years and, and in security for about 10. So I try to bring sort of a, a bit of a perspective here about my background and, and how I've used these things in the past and, and how you can really push forward with them. So what is a honeypot at its basic sort of elements? Well, in a nutshell, it's it's a distraction. A honeypot is there to be a thing that a, an attacker can go to. It's supposed to be something that looks on the face of it like me as a, as a sysadmin or me as an infrastructure owner has overseen something. There's, there's been an oversight. There's been a misconfiguration and I've, I've left this thing here. You should probably go and have a look at this, you know, from a, from a pen testing point of view, from an attacker, att attacker, it just looks like I've been lazy, forgotten something. So it's a distraction for someone to go and play with where I want them to go and play with and I don't want them to, to look at the rest of my system. It's security through obscurity, effectively. But because people are going to be interacting with it, it acts as an early warning system. So a honeypot should never be something that anyone interacts with as normal BAU, as normal business as usual activity. It should be something that sits there, never being used, and when it is being used, there's a there's a legitimate reason to be tracking that activity. So that's how you can use these things internally, and then I'll touch on externally how we use these to be bait for, for attackers. One thing that I don't really ever see be talked about is how you can use a honeypot not only for detection and, and enhancing security internally, but actually it's a very valuable source of training for an analyst, for particularly junior analysts that may normally have come into a SOC team, never having seen an attack, never having seen a 
an in-place attack and training an analyst on a on a real situation is not really the best use of anyone's time a, a, a significant incident that would need multiple people in potentially doesn't have the room for a junior to be able to spend time understanding an attack and understanding that workflow so a honeypot actually gives a very valid entry point for someone in training to be able to to spend time because it's not an actual incident spend time understanding the kill chain of an attack how did the how did the attacker gain access to the system? What files were dropped? How were they dropped? What's in those files? Going through that and being able to understand a full stream attack that is actually happening in front of them. And then also off the back of that, it's a great way to get intelligence. It's a great way to be able to, to see who's out there, who's scanning, what are they scanning? How are they scanning? And be able to build up a lot of threat intelligence very quickly and for very little overhead and cost. So those are the things that I'm going to jump into later on. But from a nutshell point of view, that's what I think a honeypot really is. So now I want to go through the differences between an internal honeypot and an external honeypot. Some examples of how I've used them, some examples about how you can use them, the benefits and, and sort of the pros and cons there. So an internal pot. So what am I wanting to find out from an inside honeypot? So this is this is a honeypot that would never be targeted. It's a a honeypot that's never going to be used internally. So I, I really wanted to trap people like insider threats. I really want to look for internal compromise. And then also selfishly as me on the blue team, I want to catch the red team out. So I want to be able to spot if a pen test is happening, I want to be able to, to spot where they're going and, and be able to trip them up because they're ultimately emulating adversaries. They're emulating bad actors inside a network and trying to find weak points. I want to also be making sure that I detect them because then my theory of detecting a pen tester is going to work in the context of, of an insider threat or, or the much worse situation of, of an internal compromise. So what do I want to do internally? And really the root of it when I'm talking about an internal honeypot is I want to fake everything. I want to fake users in Active Directory. I want to fake documents that are being stored in SharePoint or on an on-prem file system. I want to go down the route of potentially faking entire servers. And then in some cases, there are, there are honeypots out there that will allow me to completely fake Active Directory. I can have a fake Active Directory structure sitting there just waiting for someone to go in. So I want to create as many sort of low-hanging fruit for an attacker to make them target that give me those trip signals, give me those early warning systems, and then I can jump on and, and detect these attacks fairly quickly. So when I talk about fake users, I want fake domain admins in a system. I want fake uh, users that are able to be Kerberosed, so SPN accounts or accounts that have an SPN associated to them. I want to be able to fake those inside my Active Directory because there's no reason those accounts would ever be queried. And if they are queried, then someone is doing something that is unusual or there's a process that's doing something that's unusual. And me in the blue team world and me in the SOC world, that's something I want to investigate. Documents are a really good honeypot and, and I'll go into that a bit later on, but I can seed documents inside a file system or I can see documents on SharePoint, OneDrive that have no value in them, but as soon as they're opened, I get an alert. And again, that's gonna allow me to see things like processes moving through a file system and opening files, but also it kind of works for that insider threat argument that if someone is, is exfiltrating off systems, my alarms haven't picked up that they've been exfiltrating files, but now they take those files and open them outside of the network, outside of the corporate network, I can get that ping straight away. So I can start to build a picture about how files are being moved off my system. I can potentially detect someone doing some insider threat things. If I name a file something ridiculous like passwords.txt someone might be silly enough to think that they want to take that and open that and i'm going to get that alarm so really when i'm talking about internal honeypots i want to say that i'm i'm faking as much as i can i'm creating as much seeds inside my network that i'll be able to capture all of these different stages of the attack feed those into my seam and be able to detect on those very quickly so moving to an external pot, I shift my thinking a little bit because now I'm 
I'm less interested in in sort of catching a bad actor because I've moved outside of my network. Now I'm thinking more around those threat intelligence things. I want to just I want to collect information about what people are doing outside my network. It may be that I'd host the honeypot behind my firewall inside a, a DMZ, and then I could get people trying to scan my network. The argument falls down a little bit because I don't really want people probing and, and moving on to my firewall. But in most cases, I've always hosted honeypots in, in Azure or AWS or DigitalOcean, sort of anywhere I can get cheap servers, spin something up very quickly and, and leave it running for a period of time. And what I'm looking at really is, is again, low hanging fruit because I just want to see who's scanning, what are the latest attacks. So SSH is, is, is a really good one for this and I've got a, a demo of that coming up, but I want to see who's scanning SSH at the moment. I want to see what does post compromise look like. So I want to move from a low interaction honeypot, which is it might just capture usernames and passwords, but not capture the next step along. So I want to go to a high interaction honeypot, which will present an attacker with what they think is an actual system. So in SSH's case, I use a tool called Cowry. Cowry allows me to not only capture usernames and passwords and IP addresses that, that are trying to brute force, but it also allows me to let an attacker in one by one and capture what commands they're running. So in that case, I'm looking at what's happening post compromise. I'm seeing what scripts are they loading? What IP addresses are they loading? What altcoin miners are they trying to drop onto my system? Which is predominantly a lot of this bot activity is just botnets trying to grow their size. And in the meantime, they're loading on coin miners and, and things like that because they want to try and exploit my system. From a, an analyst point of view, going back to that training, this is a great tool because they're able to see those commands being issued. From a threat intelligence point of view, I can see what automated things are being used at the moment. I can see how those command strings are done. I can see what encoding is being used, what payloads are being dropped, how are those payloads being dropped, what shell scripts are being dropped. This is helping me in my blue team world because I'm staying ahead of what may happen if someone in, in a company or, or someone in a sysadmin team was to accidentally allow one of these these ports on a production server, I'm able to understand how an attacker is going to attack that. And I can create my content, I can create my analytics rules around all of that. So I'm increasing my detection by allowing myself to get hacked. And I think that that's a really good one. And then we can look at other things. We can look at RDP. RDP being enabled by default on Azure is a thing. And if you spin up a server on Azure, you will be allowed RDP by default outbound. So it's a real attack surface and it's, it's attack surface we see time and time again, particularly in ransomware, particularly in things like that is RDP being allowed outbound and then a weak password has been used on that RDP server or in that Active Directory. That's led to compromise, that's led to ransomware. RDP is a viable honeypot and there's, there's a few tools out there that allow for, for faking RDP to all the way to allowing people onto RDP servers themselves and then being able to capture exactly what was run on that server before destroying it. And then we've got websites. And then what I've added on here is, is OWA. And, and I want to go into a bit more about OWA because it's a particularly interesting thing. Three weeks ago, I think it was, we had zero days released two, three weeks ago. Zero days were released for, for Exchange. And quite quickly, you were able to spin up a honeypot that looked like it was vulnerable to these things. And that, again, gives me a massive amount of threat intelligence on something which is incredibly current and something that was impacting live customers inside the SOC. So I want to get as much information about who's trying to exploit this. And then crucially, how are they trying to exploit this? Do I have a proof of concept in the wild now? Am I starting to see bots using this? Am I starting to see automated attackers using this? Again, that's seeding my threat intelligence. That's giving me real-time threat intelligence. So going off threat intel, I want to know who's scanning. I want to know why they're scanning. And I want to know what they're trying to achieve. From my training point of view, I want to understand and give analysts, here's the latest attacks. Here's a, a live set of malware you can analyze, a live set of, of files you can dip into to really understand exactly what's happening. 
take some time and, and understand this outside of a of a normal incident, but also gives them the ability to be able to look at a full attack chain as if it was an ongoing incident. And also I want to verify that are my playbooks in play? Are my playbooks correct? I have a playbook for SSH compromise. I want to understand, is that playbook current? Here's the latest set of attacks, run through my playbook. Do I need to add in extra steps? Do I need to remove steps? Do I need to upgrade my tooling? Am I getting the correct visibility? All of these things are verifying and to be fed back into my training and pretty much my SOC development and optimization. So that was a, a very sort of brief overview of, of what honeypots are and why I think they're cool, but let's actually go and look at some. Let's go and, and look at data. So I've got two honeypots that I want to, to go over at the moment, and they sort of go from very basic honeypots all the way to very complicated, very large honeypots, but with a huge wealth of information there. So what I've got on my screen at the moment is I've set up an SSH server. This is just sitting on a dev instance of Sentinel that I have running, and it's running Cowrie. So Cowrie is a high interaction honeypot. It's an SSH honeypot, and what it does is it spoofs what a normal SSH connection would look like. And when someone logs on after a random number of password attempts, it will allow them access in, and then it will present them with what looks like a legitimate environment so they can then go off and, and try to run scripts, they can try to run files. If they try to download a file, it intercepts that download, stores it separately, and that allows me as a, as a blue team and as a, as a threat hunter to be able to access all that information. So Cowrie collects a lot of information, but the things that I'm really interested in is when I want to look at commands being run. So as command. When I've been talking about sort of that intelligence and that training, this is what I'm really wanting out of this. So Cowrie is allowing me to be able to see exactly what is inputted, exactly what things have been run, where they've been run from. And so now I can start to understand that attack. And this is great as, as me as a threat hunter, as me as as a blue team, I want to understand exactly what scripts are being run, how they're being run and where they're being run from. So in this case, I've got a bot trying to connect to it. It's using wrong syntax. I know that this isn't the packet manager on this server isn't yum. It's, it's a Debian box, so I'm using app get. So in this case, it's, it's trying to, to install wget and then it's trying to wget a file, curl some stuff down, set it as, as a, an ability to run, and then it's going to try and run a shell file off the back of it. So that's an interesting point. But what I want to know is what actually is that file? So I'm able to give this to a junior analyst to say, go through these logs. I want to know what IP addresses there are. I want to know what files are being run. Give them access to the honeypot and allow them to be able to deep dive into those files. So if I go over to my honeypot now, I go to my directory with the downloads, I can start to see all of these files that have been dropped by bots. So what we have here is, is about a week's worth of files that have been dropped to my server. And a lot of them sort of stem between shell scripts. So this, this particular file that was dropped was a, a shell script that is doing Bitcoin mining, uh, an altcoin mining. It's trying to connect to pools. It's running some scripts. It's trying to download some scripts. It's then echoing out SSH keys into my known public things. It's trying to add users. So there's a lot of stuff here that I can use as part of my threat intelligence to understand what is happening and, and how things are working. I can then start to build a better picture. So if I look at something else, this is a binary file. So this is this is not a shell script file. I've now actually got an elf binary that's been dropped to my box. So if I've got an analyst that's particularly interested in maybe understanding how this malware works from a from a program point of view, from a binary point of view, now I have the ability to be able to hand someone a piece of malware. They can use that malware, trace it back to an attack, understand how that malware got there, 
and then maybe take this off, run this through different tools, Ghidra, Cyberchef, whatever, do static analysis, dynamic analysis, load this into a, a, a sandbox. It allows them to be able to see an attack on the full chain, completely understand it and gain all of that experience for no real cost. And, and I'm just allowing attackers to bring this to me. But then if we go back, an interesting thing is, is starting to look at, well, now I understand what command was run and how it was run. Do I have a botnet? So what I want to start looking at is how often an account, how often a command was run and was it run from separate IP addresses? If it was run by separate IP addresses, potentially what I have here is a botnet and that's threat intelligence I want. That's threat intelligence that someone is giving me. So if I just summarize on count by input and by my source IP, I forgot my by. Now I can start to gain an idea about what is is happening, about what is Sentinel's been picky today. I can start to understand how someone is is interacting with my system. You name A is is obviously the highest one. I can start to see that this account has been run four times. If I throw in my to string again on source IP, I can now start to see that this IP address ran you name A twice. I can start to see patterns. I will start to be able to build up. This particular IP address has done that. This is over 24 hours. If I extend that back over three days, I start to again gain a bigger picture. All of this is great from, from my training point of view. I've got an abundance of threat intelligence here now. I can automate a bunch of tasks. I can start to say, well, there's no reason anyone is ever going to interact with this SSH in a legitimate way. I can take all these IP addresses, I can send them directly over to my firewall. I've just streamlined my threat intelligence blocking. I could take this intelligence, I could send it up to OTX, share it with the community. These are known malicious scanners. This is what they're trying to do. These are the files they dropped. I'm giving back to the community that I take a lot from. I can take this, I can seed my threat intelligence and send it across all of my other seeds. So now I can spot when someone is trying to, to interact with any of my other deployments. It's threat intelligence that people are giving me willingly that I know for a fact is 100% bad actors. If we start to look again, looking at this, I can see the same account being run across multiple IP addresses. That to me is starting to look like a botnet because again, there's no reason anyone's gonna to want to interact with this. If you're running the same script, you're calling back to the same destination. I can safely assume that this is a botnet that's trying to grow. Maybe that's something I wanna look into. I wanna start looking at what is on this 179 address. I wanna look at where these source IP addresses are coming from. Is this something I need to be aware of? Is this something trying to grow in scale? Is this someone possibly just targeting as your? Interesting things that I want to be able to pull out from that. So that's, that's a really sort of very quick way of doing it, but then maybe I want to understand what does this look like from a global perspective? One of the things that bugs me about Sentinel is I don't have geolocation out of the box, so I have to bring my own geolocation, but I can quite easily be able to turn my carry logs using the source IP address, correlate it to a list of geolocations. This one particularly is stored in, in GitHub. Now I can understand what this looks like on a country level. Where are these attacks coming from? This case, my, my top three is, is the US, China and, and Canada. I'm particularly interested in, in the US ones. I wanna see where they're coming from. Take those IP addresses. Again, I could automate this into a who is lookup. That's gonna give me the ISP that all these are coming from. That's gonna give me, again, more visibility. Carry is, is free open source software. The server that I've spun this up on is, is a very small Azure box because all it needs to do is handle SSH. The amount of insight that I've got from this is, is way more than the actual cost of running this. So it's a very cheap way to be able to do this. And it gives me a lot of information. 
this particular lookup now is using a Outlook Web Access honeypot that was that was available on GitHub, but it hadn't been updated in about three years. So what I did was take a fork of that GitHub, took a look at the code. It's a Flask app that runs Python. And what I've done is modify that so it now looks like it's vulnerable to proxy shell. And if I run an Nmap scan on it, it comes back as being a vulnerable service for proxy shell. And also it comes back as a vulnerable service for not proxy shell, the latest uh, zero day that's come out. So all I've done is spin this up on a server. I put it behind an Nginx proxy. I put a HTTPS uh, certificate on it and I put it behind a domain and I've just left it there running. And you do get a lot of just internet scanners. So I've gone through and started to block out some of those. There's a Palo Alto one that constantly pops up that's trying to just scan. But what you start to see quite slowly is people targeting an area of the honeypot that you wouldn't normally navigate to unless you were specifically looking for a problem. And in this case, it's my auto discover and my auto discover JSON. That's the area that I know is susceptible to proxy shell. That's the bit that the MMAP scanner is looking to see whether or not it's vulnerable. So now I can start to build a picture about how someone is going onto this system and particularly how they're looking. So again, I've got some auto discovered JSON. There's nothing in there that's particularly interesting from my point of view because it's not giving me the, the exploit that's being used. But if I go back a couple more days, I can now start to see attackers using those strings trying to go in and these are these are known um these are known proof of concept values so now i know that people are scanning my honeypot they're looking for particular places that i know are, are vulnerable and in this case this is someone pretending to be an ipad and they're starting to to go in and actually try and exploit my system and these again interesting areas that I want to look at. I want to see who's doing this. What's my latest attack? Do I need to write rules to detect this? Do I need to write rules to detect user agents? What is being used in these user agents? What's the latest strings that are coming out? Is this a get request? Is this a pull request? Is this a push request? I want to be able to see all of this information because now I've set up a pipeline to take all these IP addresses and block them straight away. And now I can take that information send that over to my other systems because I know that a lot of these people are looking at and trying to exploit my system and they have no right to be there. So I start to see other things. I can start to see someone trying to fuzz the server in this case using um, FFUF. That's a, a tool I use in, in sort of red team activity. That's a tool that I use to, to enumerate things. Again, there's no real reason anyone should be using F a fast fuzz on my system. They're doing it for a malicious reason. I want to take them out and I want to take care of them. So that's sort of an overview of, of a couple of honeypots that I have running inside of Azure. What I wanted to show as well is if you don't have a seam or you don't have access to a seam, it doesn't matter. There are things out there that come fully packaged. So there is a brilliant honeypot package that's developed by T-Mobile, the, the phone company. It's called T-Pod. It's kind of expensive to run in the cloud because it needs about eight gig of RAM and a couple of CPUs, but it comes with everything you'd ever need and it comes in a brilliant package. So from my threat hunting perspective, I can go into my T-Pod account and I'm going to have, I think it's now 20 honeypots running at once and I get this front end for it. So it's a front end that's run on Elastic and it gives me an insane amount of information. So I spun this, this honeypot up last night in Azure and I've already had tens of thousands of attacks on it. So I've got tens of thousands of data points that I can look at. So I've had attacks on, on my DDoS, I've had cowrie attacks inside of here, Honeytrap, Diana, ABD, so the Android debugging bridge, ASA honeypots in here, Citrix honeypots in here. And I can start to see 
from a single pane of glass exactly what's happening here. So if I don't have access to a scene, you know, I'm doing this on my own. I just want to do this for research. I just want to do this for, for threat intelligence, or I want to give this to, to someone to get them up to speed. The cost is sort of outweighed by the fact that it comes with its own scene effectively. So from my threat intelligence point, it's a brilliant tool that I can use to gain an insane amount of visibility. And then also because what sock is a sock without a interactive map that, that shows things flashing around the screen? Well, this honeypot comes with an attack map as well. So it's something that's, that's cool. It's something that's very visual. It's something that, that I can throw up on a screen somewhere if I wanted to show someone my honeypot being attacked in real time, it doesn't really give me much information from a from a blue teamer or from a threat hunter perspective, but it's a nice thing to have there. What I'm wanting to do from my side is really drill into exactly what's happening here. And I've got dashboards for every single one of my honeypots, all of the different things that I would ever want to look at. So if I wanted to look for um, network intrusion, network intrusion comes through this through Suricata. This is going to give me access to, to Suricata logs. So now I can see how someone was interacting. What, what, how did the network look like? What did I get from that network perspective? This is brilliant from my blue team world because I start to build a picture about how attacks are being used again, how things are being implemented, what headers are being used, what's my content types, what the top content types, source IP addresses, everything from my Suricata logs. Suricata is a brilliant tool to run internally because it's going to give me a lot of visibility on, on traffic going in and out. So potentially this is something I might want to learn how to bring into my internal honeypots. I want to bring it in as just an internal reporting tool, less of a honeypot. But again, I can understand and, and start to shape information. I can start to take IP addresses, source IP addresses, start to look at ASNs. I want to know what networks are coming from. And then I've got CVEs of, of known targeted attacks there on the side. From my research point of view, brilliant information. Blue team in point of view, brilliant information. It's a, an expensive thing to run in the cloud. I think this will probably cost about 60 pounds to run on, on the current setup. You could probably get it running cheaper if you looked at dot instances, but there are ways of being able to run this on hardware as well. It will run on a laptop in a VM. It'll run on a Nook. Um, I don't think it runs on a Raspberry Pi. I think it's it's a bit too much for a Raspberry Pi, but it's out there. You could run this on DigitalOcean for less than that. Um, there's plenty of places that this could be done and give a lot of information very quickly. So that's that's sort of my my hunting demo and and trying to show how I use these honeypots and and what I want to use these honeypots for and try to give you a bit of an idea about what you want to do around these honeypots and, and try to use them. So if we go back, swap back. So how can I use them? So I, I touched on the OWA one. The OWA one came out of necessity for me. I wanted, as soon as we had a zero day announced, I wanted to understand what my attack surface looked like and who was using them. I could have spun up an exchange server, but an exchange server is going to cost me money. I don't want to have to maintain an exchange server. So I went off and looked for a honeypot that was around it. The honeypot was a little bit old. I know Python a little bit, so I was able to customize it. So I went from a zero day being released to about six hours later, having a viable honeypot having a viable method of being able to detect these accounts and having something out there that was giving me the intelligence I wanted as a blue team to be able to create my rules while still gaining information from various write-ups, various Twitter accounts that were posting about this, any GitHub repositories that popped up, the Microsoft write-up on the actual vulnerability. I'm starting to take all of that information on its face value, but also being able to seed it from my experience. So. I was able to take the CVE. It didn't cost me anything really. Um, it's a very small instance and Python's free. So I didn't have to pay anything. I didn't have to use expensive software. Another one going back to those internal ones is 
quite commonly in my blue team world, I come up against pen tests and I, I come up against attacks where Cobra roasting is an element of that attack. And Cobra roasting is notoriously quite hard to pick up unless you have rules that are doing sophisticated time series analysis. Basically, you're looking for an account being queried more than it would normally be queried in a regular sort of BAU. So an SPN account is going to be queried a lot because it's used as part of a service. If I look at the MySQL account that is, is commonplace, it's going to be queried hundreds, if not thousands of times a day in some cases. If that has a weak password, that's prime real estate for a Kerber hosting attack. But what I want to do is capture people doing things en masse, but any red team are worth their, their salt is not going to be doing many attacks on a Kerberos. They're going to do maybe one sweep of the environment with a tool like Bloodhound. They're going to do one pass over the Active Directory using something like Impacket. And that's going to be only registering one more event than what would normally be in a day. The time series thing isn't going to pick that up without generating a huge amount of noise. So how can I detect this? Well, a honey user, a honey pot. If I create a user inside of Active Directory that has all of the indicators of being a Kerber roastable account, but there's no right or reason why that account would ever be queried, well, that's a really easy way. I've just amplified my, my detection strings internally. I've amplified my detections internally for pen testers. I've amplified it internally for, for people doing malicious things. You know, Kerber roasting is going to be used to try and gain an elevated account. Any Quackbot deployment, any, any Kerber roasting, uh, any Cobot strike deployment is going to involve some element of Kerber roasting eventually because it's real estate that is, that is there and it's historically not secured very well. These accounts were potentially very old. They have very insecure passwords and they've never been changed because they're critical accounts. If I can try and intercept those accounts very easily, why would I not do that as a blue teamer? And I think that's, it's a really good example of, of detection and trying to obscure and fake as much in there. I can go back to, like I talked about, Canary accounts and, and Canary tokens. If I was to drop a file in there, I can write very simple methods of, of being able to detect those. So. What I want to do now is, is go back to my demo environment and start talking about things like canary files. So if I go to, to Sentinel, I'm able to write a detection in here that's able to pick up any file that was open from one of my canary tokens. So with a very simple logic app, I'm able to take a webhook, I'm able to process information from a webhook and then send that into my Sentinel instance. So one of the tools that I've used here is a, is a tool called Canary Tokens. Canary Tokens is, is a free to use piece of software. Uh, it's a website and it allows me to create multiple different things. I can create key vault accounts. I can create Word documents, Excel documents. And as soon as that document's opened, it queries a webhook. So by creating this logic app, I pass a webhook. As soon as that file's open, it queries this website. It then passes over some information in JSON. I then pass that straight over into a, into a Sentinel incident, and bam, I've got someone doing something malicious internally for next to no cost. There is a cost associated to a logic app run, but it's less than a fraction of a penny. And this isn't going to be something that's run every day hopefully so i've just been able to set something inside my network and inside my environment that is able to be detected very easily for no cost that gives me huge amounts of benefits in my blue team world so what else is out there what what should you like uh da -da -da. The OWA honeypot. So I've made it available on GitHub. 
it's not the best Python in the world. I'm not, I'm not a Python programmer uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but it works for me. And I think there's, there's benefits for it being out there. So when you leave the webinar, you'll get the slides in PDF format, the links there, go try it, take the code, have a play with the code. I'm gonna be updating it um, sort of periodically. One of the things that I wanna add in is at the moment, the log file is a flat log file that comes out. I wanna turn it into JSON just because it makes my life easier in, in processing world, but it's there. Go, go take this honeypot, go spin it up somewhere and just wait for people to try and interact with it, see how they're interacting with it. And, and that's sort of my main takeaway there is I built this out, go use it. I think it's interesting. I think it's cool. I think there's benefits there. Here's a load of other things that I've used and that I've talked about using. So Cowrie, the free to use honeypot, SSH honeypot, very easy to set up. I wrote a blog on, on how to set it up in Azure. I think there's there's massive up benefits there of, of using that. Teapot is brilliant, and I'll probably write a blog about how to get that running in Azure. It's a little bit fiddly to get it running in Azure properly because it's more developed for, for sort of AWS and, and actual running it on TIN. I'll write a blog on, on how to get that up and running in Azure because I think it's, again, a really good tool that has massive upsides to it and, and really allows people to be able to visualize data in a way that I've not seen available. And again, it's free. It's free software on GitHub. RDP, using the twisted Python stuff, again, it's a high interaction honeypot. It uses RDP. It's a little bit fiddly to get running. I, I managed to get it running before it took some work and I needed to have a an older server to make a clone from, but it works and it's out there. And again, Canary Tokens is that last one. That's the one I've used for, for looking at things like files, looking at things inside a, a system. Take a look at that. There's some really brilliant stuff there that's, that's free and open source again. Take a look at them, use them, play with them because that's how you understand things. That's how I understand things and that's how I, I make myself what I think is a better blue teamer. The more information I have at my hands, the more information I'm able to learn, the more information I'm able to pass down to, to people in the SOC, to junior analysts, to junior engineers, people who want to, to maybe understand these things in a bit of context. This is what I use, this is what I think is cool. Try it, give it a whirl. You know, the only thing it's gonna cost you is some of your credit, really, uh, at the end of the day. So there we go. That is is honeypots in a nutshell. That was Any awesome. Questions? Thank you. Um, there's only a couple in the chat actually about recording. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely share the the recording and the slides with you. There are a couple of questions I am um, knocked together actually. Um, so when it comes to um, deploying honeypots for training. What what risks are there, um, and and how how can we how can we advise people to manage those? I mean, at the end of the day, you are letting someone attack your system. These are these are bad things that are happening on here. These these are known attackers. So particularly if spinning stuff up in cloud, it's a little bit easier because I can set this up in its own VNet. I can completely isolate it away from anything else. I can make sure it doesn't have any callbacks or anything like that and it just sits there and I know that I can destroy the machine at will and, and get rid of it. So be careful with what you do, particularly if it's in maybe a production environment or, or, or a dev environment in Azure that's, that's not your own, but it's very easy to be able to isolate these things. If you're doing it behind sort of a firewall, it becomes a little bit more fiddly and you should know the risks of doing that before you, you go out and do it. But in the cloud these days, it's very easy to be able to spin these things up in a secure way, an isolated way, and be able to quickly destroy it and rebuild it. And I think that's, you know, that's the benefit of the cloud, right? Yeah. We so actually we've just had a so from Richard. Uh, Richard has asked, um, is it a good starting point? Uh, or are, so are Canary token, uh, sorry, are Canary tokens a good starting point um, to then move on to more technical honeypots like you've shown? I think it is. I, I, I think it absolutely is because it's it's so low effort and the upsides of having it is is a brilliant way to be able to get in. All you have to do 
is have something that is able to take a webhook and that's it. So I could I could build a Teams bot to do this for me. I could do a logic app to do this for me. I could set up a very sort of quick and dirty pipeline in 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 something online to be able to take that information. And it's not going to take me any time at all to be able to do it. And it's it's a really good stepping stone to be able to start to to gain intelligence about how things are happening, particularly on the internal network, but maybe look at some of the other canary tokens that are on there. There are websites and other things, and there's there's AWS tokens and things like that. So you can start to to put files in places where there probably shouldn't be files and see who's interacting with those files. Yes, there's some sort of element of it being a little bit ethical around that, but it's it's a great way to be able to to start around gaining this information, looking at the things and, and looking at it from a, a honeypot example, and then starting to look at maybe SSH ones or or moving towards sort of more sophisticated ones and, and how I can use them to to protect my own internal environment. Spot on. Um Calvin has asked, um, so with malware and binary, would you then set this up in something like Remnux to have a play around with static and dynamic binary, or would you recommend something else? I, there's there's a thousand one tools out there. Um, everyone has their preference. I have I have a preference for any run for for my dynamic analysis. I use Ghidra um, for for sort of static analysis, strings, XSD things like that. So th there's no right or wrong thing. Um, you could set up automated things to go into um, like automated platforms, any run um, off the top of my head, I'm going Cuckoo. You could run your own instance of Cuckoo internally, send it over into there to do analysis automatically. So there's no right or wrong way of doing any of this. It's, it's entirely your preference um, on how you want to be able to do it. And again, I, I tried to sort of push that to when I talk to internal people about this is just because I do it one way doesn't mean it's at all the best way to do it. I just know those tools and know how to use them. If you know other tools or you're familiar with other tools, by all means, crack on. I use Ghidra, use Ida, use uh, Binary Ninja. There's, there's all sorts of different tools out there and they all have their pros and cons and, and they all have their methods of working. So yeah, no right way of saying use this one tool, do what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then from Armit, um, so honeypots can be uh, useful more in catching data exfiltration type attacks or threat act, in fact, actually. Do you, uh, can you see that one, Tom? It might be easier if you read it, actually. It's quite a long one. Uh, no, the, the question box is quite small, am I? Is it? I'll read it out as it is, okay. So honeypots can be useful more in catching data exfiltration type attacks or a threat actor, usually uh, infecting systems using phishing and post encryption. Is there any way that we can certainly, uh, hmm. maybe, um, maybe we can get back to that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, there was one, oh, go on. Do you, want to, do you want to ping it on Teams? That's probably the... Yeah, we'll do. Um, in the meantime as well, though, so there was one that I wanted to ask. So you mentioned the security through obscurity thing. Where do you stand on that? Um, can honeypots actually be used effectively as a decoy? I, I, I think there's, there's absolute benefit to using them. And security through obscurity is kind of a little bit sort of a, you either love it or you hate it. I hate it in equal measures as much as I love it. Um, I think there's there's definite space for it. It needs to be, particularly in, in a large organization, it needs to be carefully planned. It needs to be carefully thought through. Um, it needs to be targeted in a very specific way. Um, so I think there's there's plenty of, of scope there to use things internally. A lot of tools are starting to come out with their own honeypots built in internally. Um, Center One, our EDR tool of choice, they have elements of honeypots in there. Um, Rapid7 has elements of honeypots in their products. Um, there's there's a lot of stuff going on that allows you to be able to deploy stuff internally that 
lives alongside a lot of your existing kit and a lot of your existing sort of stuff. But when you start to go into things like honey users, honey tokens, things like that, there's there's an element of planning that needs to be done from a blue team perspective, working in conjunction with with system owners and, and SecOps teams internally, at least from my world in, in the MSSP world. But there's definite room for it and there's there's definite ways to be able to to do a lot of this stuff. It just needs planning a little bit more than than sticking someone on the external. Okay, well we'll wrap up there. Um if the audience has if you guys have any more um questions. Oh actually one more. Can we utilize can we utilize honeypot trap to detect encryption type attacks? There's probably a honeypot out there that does something. Um, there are, if someone has an idea about how to detect something, there's probably a honeypot written about it. I can't say I've come up across one, but there's a stupid levels of, of things out there. Um, I think there are, you know, when you start to think about encryption, there's, I think there was a couple of vulnerabilities around Windows certs and things like that. I believe there's honeypots around that, but encryption's a wide topic. Um, there's probably a honeypot somewhere. I'd say go have a look. There's there's a couple of GitHubs that are really good for for searching that keep lists of things like honeypots. I mean, Teapot is is a great one because there's a load of tea, honeypots you can use out the box. I mean, the the ones that I showed in this demo was just the standard build. There are specific builds for things like ICS, industrial control systems, medical systems. There's one that's got every honeypot enabled on it. So there may very well be one in there that's that's of interest. So go out, have a look, have a play. Perfect. Okay, well, um, um, for anyone that enjoyed this uh, event with Tom, um, we do actually have another webinar on December 1st, um, which is about threat hunting with the Pyramid of Pain. Um, so if you are interested in that, please do come along. Um, and yeah, we hope that you have a really um, good rest of the day. And thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.